what generations of philosophers and systematicians have struggled to hold together, the New Testament appears to do effortlessly with central Jewish categories. The Messiah represents his people, and so like David taking on Goliath on behalf of Israel as a whole, he can go by himself to do battle with the ultimate enemy. That's why he tells his followers in the garden, you aren't to be involved in this. Uh, you watch and pray that you don't have to enter this time of testing. Jesus has to do it alone. He is to win the victory for those he represents. Now, once we grasp this, we see the normal theories in a very different light. People like to speak of models of the atonement or various metaphors which can be used or not according to taste to build up this or that system. That is at best an abstraction a way of holding back from total immersion in the historic biblical story. The theories that people have grandly called Christus Victor, Christ the Victor, or representation, or substitution, and the different words which cluster around them, like redemption and reconciliation, all of these mean what they mean in the New Testament in relation to that single coherent great story, which the Gospels claim is reaching its climax, the story of Israel's failure and the Messiah's victory, of human failure and God's victory. It is not, however, to anticipate an objection many people raise today, it is not a grand crescendo, a story of a progressive revelation or progressive development. There's nothing progressive about it at all, because without the resurrection, no one would ever have dreamed of seeing Jesus' crucifixion as the fulfillment of a long, slowly developing revelation. It would be nothing more than another ghastly, gaping hole in the shattered dreams and hopes of a people. But when we look back from the post-resurrection viewpoint, it becomes clear. And in particular, we can understand the interconnection between the victory of the cross and the substitution for sins. The root of all human sin is idolatry, worshipping something other than the creator God. What happens when you worship that which is not God? is that your humanness, your God-reflecting, image-bearing vocation starts to fracture, and the name for that is sin, missing the mark of genuine humanness. To put it another way, we humans are endowed at creation with the glorious task Psalm 8 reflects it as well as Genesis 1, the task of reflecting God's power and love into the world but when we worship idols, we give to those idols a measure of that power which should be ours, and we reduce and distort our human vocation in consequence. And our sin thus becomes the chain with which the idols we have worshipped hold us in their grip. So here's the point. For the idols to be defeated and overthrown, the chain must be cut, sins must be dealt with. So the penal substitution that we find in scripture is not a different model of atonement to be played off against the idea of Jesus' victory over the powers or Jesus as our representative. It is because he is our representative as Israel's Messiah that he can appropriately be our substitute. And it's because he was and is our substitute that his dealing with sin has robbed the powers of their enslaving dominion. This is what the Gospels are telling us. Paul picks it up, Galatians, Romans, and elsewhere. Hebrews reflects the same train of thought. Revelation sees it from several different angles, but it's that same train of complex but coherent thought. <laughs>